Welcome everybody um, to this first light talk. Uh, my name's Sarah Fisher and I'm lucky enough to be running Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool. Um, so this is the first, the first talk in the First Light series. And First Light really started out as a program that was quite, quite known. It was a program to support um, exceptional photography students from across the North with the idea that they didn't get a degree show last year because of COVID. And we were, we were working together to put a degree, to put a show on of exceptional students um, in Manchester. But actually it's morphed into something much, much more innovative. Um, and that's kind of what we're here to talk about today, this new model. And I'm gonna introduce you to two really dynamic people um, who have basically forced OpenEye and a number of other partners into putting everything we've got into this program. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing Mario Popham. He's a curator, uh, a photographer and an educator based in Manchester. Um, he has a role at, as visual arts coordinator at Waterside Trafford and he's currently working towards establishing a dedicated photography program for the Greater Manchester area. His first show um, there was called Sweet Debris, which many of you may have seen, and it took place in the gallery in 2019. As a practitioner, his interests really lie in man's complex relationships with the natural environment, with a particular focus on the legacy of our industrial heritage. His work's been shown at, merit, at various venues, um, including Home in Manchester and the Groundwork Gallery in Kings Lynn. Also with us tonight is Laura Robertson, She's a writer, critic, critic and editor. She's from Anfield in Liverpool and she graduated with a BA in visual art from the University of Salford in uh, 2008. And she has an MA in the writing programme at the Royal College where she finished last year. She's written critically and creatively about art for about a decade for international magazines, including Art Monthly, AN and Freeze. And she's a guest critic on BBC Radio 4's Front Row. Laura curates and exhibits, teaches and collaborates with other writers and editors and artists in galleries, colleges, universities and communities, in fact, everybody in the world, um, as a creative writer and as a creative practitioner. So I'm going to start by handing over to you guys. Um, Mario, perhaps could I ask if you to actually introduce your part in the project, you know, how it came about? Yes, yes, sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah, and Open Eye. Um, so, yeah, this came about, it's very much a, a COVID project, really, um, in terms of that it, it gave us a space to, 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 to come up with this, in, in a sense. And uh, as you mentioned, yeah, we're, we're trying to put together a, a uh, photography focused programme at Waterside. And obviously COVID came along and put quite a big spoke in our wheels. Um, so it was at that point that um, I started thinking about uh, where where there might be a need and what what we could do in this situation where you know in this really frustrating situation where we couldn't really do much uh, in the in the kind of gallery world. So so um, having worked in HE for a long time, it was actually in the back of my mind to actually uh, to put something together really for 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 uh, for this amazing kind of work that's coming out of higher education on an annual basis. And I know it's incredibly tough coming out of university that first couple of years. Is you know you you kind of cast a adrift a little bit from your uh, from the safety of university and you have to you have to make these opportunities for yourself so um so i wanted to see if it seemed right a like a ripe time to try and offer this really as a as a potential potential project so i started casting around and trying to get interest and uh yeah luckily got some sponsors straight away people like spectrum photographic nq photo studios and village leads were really quite eager just to uh, to to help and, and offer more opportunities so it's kind of just building this from from scratch and a lot of the university of universities i contacted were really eager too and then i asked i got sarah involved and yeah and she put kind of rocket boosters on it as only sarah knows how and uh and it's become this kind of big uh, project, a big kind of ambitious project. Brought Laura, Laura Roberts in, um, involved too, and uh, on board too. And it was uh, that that was fantastic because I've worked with Laura previously on Sweet Debris, and yeah, she she she's incredible in terms of 
the, the kind of uh, the the inspiring kind of writing that she she brings into photography. She understands photography and uh, the relationship with with the medium and writing. So that was since then. Yeah, it's just been all go really. Uh, apart from obviously, we're supposed to show this last year in August initially, and then February, and now here we are. And uh, we've actually brought on we've actually partnered with Castlefield Gallery as well now to find an alternative venue because Waterside being closed for the time being. So it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a journey and we will have this physical exhibition in May at Castlefield New Art Spaces in Warrington now. And uh, that's, yeah, it feels like a bit of a guerrilla exhibition really. We're taking over this kind of a, this uh, ex retail space and, and again, kind of building something from scratch. So it's all very exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm really amazed that we're here and we're doing this. So yeah. And, um, I mean, amazing amount of work, Mario, you put into this. And I kind of, I know when, when Laura came on board, um, there was, there started to be this kind of, what could we do moment because we couldn't show uh, in Waterside. Laura, could you just talk us through, you know, your input and, you know, how, how, you, how it started out and how you took it forward? Well, you've really been supportive of my writing practice for a number of years now, Sarah, and, and, really you put rocket boosters under my career <laughs> by taking me on as a resident um writer in 2018 just before i started ema at the uh, rca that same year and it really made me think about think about my writing as a creative practice um outside of this idea of of an art critic being somehow in combat um, with artists or writing in a certain way or format or style or tone and I really wanted to make I really wanted to be a better writer and through working at Open Eye with you and the team and kind of simultaneously doing this very exciting MA um, we thought didn't we that would be really exciting to recruit a number of graduate writers as well to pair up with the graduate photographers and just see what would happen and because I studied BA visual arts I've come into writing from that angle never thinking I'd be paid to write <laughs> never thinking that could be a profession for me it's just been very exciting to recruit writers from non-traditional degrees so we've got writers from yes creative writing BAs but they're also for you know they're also poets artists photographers in their own right so it's been very very exciting to pair up um and just kind of see what would come out of conversations and interviews and meeting up over zoom and forming this really interesting little peer group now so that they only they're not only going to have an exhibition together and speak for themselves in this talk series. We're gonna hear directly from them about their practice and ideas and research concerns. But we're also publishing this really brilliant little publication of new writing about photography. And it's taken all different shapes and forms and it's been really exciting to work on. Brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm pleased that you're both you're both here and you kind of keep us on 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 our toes uh, at Open Eye with new ideas all the time. And I'm going to talk a little bit more um, um, or ask you to talk a little bit more about your experience of COVID in a minute. But just before so, everybody that's in the audience, we have uh, a chat function. Please do post on chat. We've also got uh, a Q and A box. Um, so if you've got any questions for for Laura or Mario, please stick them in the Q&A box. Um, I ask everyone always to be respectful of everybody that's, that's speaking here tonight and of each other, um, but please do contribute. We'd love to hear from you. So Murray, if we just go back a minute and just, could you, could you kind of give, give some sense of your experience of working with graduates during lockdown? Because it's, it's been a very odd time, I think for everyone, um, but it's opened up some opportunities as well as challenges, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been. Uh, I mean, it's. I think it's so important that the the physical um, aspect of of, of 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 showing your work really, and it's that's that's one thing that's been that's uh, that they've been you know it's been neglected, not neglected, but it's not been possible basically um, throughout all this. And yeah, it's it's the kind of crowning moment when all your ideas come to fruition really in your third year. So it's yeah, to, to not be able to realize that must be incredibly frustrating. So, um, so it's, it's, it's been, it's been really interesting. Yeah. To be able to, 
to uh to, to help realize um and to kind of facilitate the, the realization of these kind of ideas and images which have only existed on screen for the most part so so that's been really rewarding um and it's obviously still an ongoing process at the moment which has been a bit stop start um uh as you can imagine but it's yeah it's it's brilliant really and it's 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 the kind of it's the side of curating which which I, I really enjoy um that's that's the kind that's the the main enjoyment really um and the main buzz of kind of helping to to produce that work and help realize that work you know that's and the main buzz of being an educator as well or um you know so that that part that final bit of the process is, is brilliant so so yeah that's that's been really exciting and, and to be able to carry that on via zoom uh and there's a lot of photographers that, I'm, that we're working with so it's juggling a lot of elements and seeing what's possible but it's, yeah it's it's proving really worthwhile I think yeah so, yeah I mean I have to say I've been lucky enough to, sh to look at some of the work and there is some exceptional work there and and what I thought from from my perspective is the variety of work so we've got some amazing young photographers all of all of whom seem to have a very distinctive voice yeah. which is a joy for us obviously to, to to witness and I think you know similarly for us working with with photographers during lockdown it's been very difficult and and Laura I should imagine Similar for you, working as you do in many, with many, many different heads on um, during lockdown has been a, a, a tricky time. Well, this project really connected with me because I graduated from my MA during lockdown last year. So I had first hand experience of not only putting myself through a really intellectually and financially challenging postgrad, but then thinking, OK, I don't get an exhibition at the RCA, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I wanted to do the MA. So what now? And it was a really, ex really interesting, <laughs> stressful experience. And w one which was actually really positive. We took it onto, onto a website. We had a RCA graduation showcase online. We had talks that we organized, delivered ourselves. I ended up getting signed by a talent agency who saw my work on the website so it does work online programming does still work people see see your practice see your writing see your images they talk about it they get in touch so it's been interesting to kind of to adapt away from physical the physical gallery space and see what's possible i suppose online um you can still be supportive we've we've been doing a series of mentoring sessions, me and the graduates, talking about all sorts of things from pitching to magazines to work experience when the lockdown lifts. And it really struck me, one of, my, one of the graduates um, that's on the programme, when I asked her to participate, she said that the opportunity had come at a point where she completely lost hope in pursuing her dream of a career in the arts. She felt like the government had sent a clear message that the arts weren't valued. She felt like at a complete loss. And just being part of the project, just being invited to be part of this, renewed her hope. And she just felt that support and community and opportunity. Um, and she had something to focus on that was fun and engaging and meant that she met new people and made new work. She was asked to write something and and as a as a kind of blossoming writer who's only really engaged with the dissertation in terms of formal text this was a brilliant opportunity to write something very short subjective and creative and just have fun with writing as well so it's kind of like a it's kind of been a, a low pressure opportunity I think I hope for the graduates involved but it the outcomes are really amazing I'm so pleased that they get to take part in this exhibition in Warrington and they're going to be published for the first time in a book that they can keep and will be part of their portfolio so yeah it's been it's been interesting hasn't it <laughs> not all good obviously we can you know we can't just replace everything with online content and that's why the exhibition is so important and why the print is so important I think you're right. And I think uh, obviously we are going to have the exhibition. It's going to happen. So as many people as possible, hopefully will will come and see that. But I think I do think what the two of you have done is you've created this package. Actually, that if COVID hadn't happened, 
we probably wouldn't have gone to this extent of developing ways of operating. Um, yeah. So I think you've kind of trialed a package which is a kind of kickstart boost, if you like, to early career. But we all know that early career is difficult even without COVID. So I wondered if just for a second, you could both give us a little sense of what was your early career like and what do you think is kind of essential for people starting out and wanting to kind of develop the way in which they operate within the real world once they come out of college? Mario, perhaps you could kick off first. Sure, yeah. I mean, um, it, was, uh, it was a slow start <laughs> uh, after uni. And it was, yeah, you, you spend a couple of years just trying to make sense of, you know, life after uni and, and which direction to head in and what, what, what opportunities are there actually out there. It's, it's quite hard to figure out the landscape, really, initially. Uh, but then, you know, you, you get stuck into open calls and you get stuck into, uh, you try and find relevant jobs, any kind of relevant jobs that, that fit with your practice. And um, yeah, what's one of the big breaks was, I guess, was, um, yeah, no, certainly it was the open call for, for Corner House. Uh, and yeah, I was working on a long term project. And um, yeah, it was, it was for their gallery. Um, it was for their kind of second gallery space in the bar, etc. The Corner House was, uh, for those of you who don't know, is, is, was pre home, basically. Yeah, it was a wonderful gallery and cinema and art house in Manchester before they moved and expanded their um their venue so yeah i was I, I didn't know anyone at the time had an absolute zero kind of like network or uh you know I, I was you know i was just trying to make work and get it seen and and yeah that was that was an amazing break so you know i can't i can't emphasize enough the importance of those kind of opportunities and just being getting stuck into them really and from that i've built a relationship with corner house since and home etc so and then and then everything leads on to another thing doesn't it so so yeah it's this, this kind of building gradual building of networks and i was fortunate enough to work at a university as well uh, university of bolton as a technician for a, for a while for a long time on a part-time basis which was again got access to people talking about photography people the facilities obviously and you know this this kind of stuff that keeps you keeps you you know hopeful and optimistic and uh, productive so yeah so I was yeah I've, I've been fortunate but it took a while to get there definitely yeah what about you Laura because you graduated in 2008 so so what what you know how was your early days after graduation feels like a hundred years ago now <laughs> well, a long time ago darling <laughs> <laughs> it's still um it's still many of the same things apply really don't they I mean, when I first graduated and I teach now, I teach at university as a lecturer. So I also see people graduate every year. Um, you feel like you've dropped through the earth, like all your support systems and routine is suddenly completely gone. So over the, over the, the joy of, of the degree show and the graduation ceremony that's all fun and then you're kind of worried about what you're going to do but then suddenly you're not allowed back into uni and your studio is gone what the hell do you do and it's the same now but with lots of complex added you know challenges um if if you're not rich if you're not well off if you don't have contacts if you're from somewhere like me where traditionally people don't go and work in the arts or especially work for magazines what what are you to do if you haven't done any volunteering or work experience through uni what are you to do if there aren't any assistant curator jobs you can apply for what are you to do or residencies if you haven't actually had even that discussion of how to apply for open calls or where you would find open calls residencies paid work what are you to do so a lot balances on the experience that you've had within university and I know at the University of Salford they have an excellent exit velocity they call it um program which really starts in second year and runs right through third year where we talk about everything from funding you know and they actually self-initiate projects so they've got stuff on their CV already but they've got that teamwork and experience and everything but also it's about developing that peer group, right? And I would say, even if you've had a terrible university experience, you can develop your own peer group. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from creating 
your own support systems, even while you're at uni. So of course you've got people you probably vibe with in third year in your own year group, maybe someone from the year above or below, and maybe you want to start a film night at uni or, you know, just swap books or whatever, or just talk in the break. That's important. And it's those small acts of kindness and friendship that sustain you right when you've graduated all three of us know what it's like to try and nurture and maintain a peer group through our lives and we're all you know this is a lifelong process we're all trying to maintain a career it it doesn't stop after the first year or two years for me what was important was getting a studio at the Royal Standard, something I really wanted and it was cheap enough for me to do, 35 quid a month <laughs> for a space. And we would, do, we would do stuff together all the time and that really gave me a kick up the arse, you know? So I couldn't just be lazy or, or let my full-time job get in the way. I had to go at weekends, I had to do stuff. So that was, that was kind of the main thing for me as well as work experience. Just fitting that in when I could. Um, but even today, I still do the same thing. So I still volunteer. I still, you know, um, I'm part of book clubs. I'm still part of a um, a writing seminar group and WhatsApp chat. Anything that sustains me, anything that gives me energy, I'm all over it. <laughs> and I, I try hard to to kind of keep that going. And she has a lot of energy, I can tell you, this girl. Um, so I, th I think that's true. And I, I kind of think one of the things that's come out of this is obviously there is now a peer group. All, all, of, the, all of the people that are involved in First Light effectively become a peer group. There was a really interesting bit of research that was done around uh, Glasgow School of Art a number of years ago where they were kind of looking at why all of a sudden Glasgow had become very, very um, important nationally in terms of that kind of young generation or new generation of practitioners coming out of the school. And the report was called Hunting Impacts. And it was very much around actually a group of you can make stuff happen. You can, you find ways of what, you know, egging each other on, not giving up, making stuff happen in the world. And I think we have a group of peers here. We've also now got used to virtual platforms. So I'm wondering, Mario, what you think the potential is for virtual platforms for that kind of hunting in packs? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a lot of untapped potential so far with this model. You know, we've got all these people together already. Um, you know, Laura's made a great start with just putting, pairing all these photographers with, with writers and, and it's just kind of put them together and then just off they go, really. And it's, and that's that, I think that's some, you know, some really magical things can happen there and some like great kind of, creative chemistry can happen there and I think it's it's making those situations setting those situations up to happen really so making them possible so I think I think there's a lot of stuff that we can still do it was just like very much early days pilot uh, first year pilot and we're we're you know we're just uh we're just building this thing but I think it's yeah at some point I think it would be great just to give them some independence really with in terms of I've been speaking to the photographers individually but how, how about they take charge of some of this and that you know and and actually and have some autonomy and some agency so I think yeah it'll be yeah I think I, I'd like to explore that really and uh and for it to become like you know like a first like club or something like that something where they can share ideas and develop develop their work further yeah I think I mean Laura yeah. you you talked earlier um when we were speaking beforehand you talked about not asking for permission which I think is you know it's one of the golden rules of actually success, isn't it? You know, you come together as a group, you decide to do something, forget, if it, forget about all of us, people who are kind of established in the, in the sector, bring us on board if you can. But that kind of idea of not asking permission, I think really important. What, would you like to expand on that a little bit, you know, from your perspective? Well, it, it's so important, isn't it? And if you've got very few resources to hand, then you kind of have to just self-initiate and do stuff. I remember really keenly like how hard it was applying for jobs when I first graduated because I just didn't have enough experience. And I was really into being an assistant curator and I really didn't know what that meant. Looking back, I really didn't know what that meant day to day. Um, 
even though I'd volunteered all the way through uni at the um, CFCCA in Manchester, the brilliant tiny art gallery with the library and the residency space. And I had a brilliant time there and I learned a lot, but I still didn't really know how to apply that experience to applying for jobs, what different art galleries did, what they expected of an assistant, just tons of stuff like that. And I learned that through the kind of DIY approach at the Royal Standard where we basically had to chip in and just do everything from cleaning the toilets to curate shows so that was my like big steep learning curve and it also taught me to kind of trust my instinct more because you were just expected to do things and to a certain quality you know standard or quality everyone had to enjoy it and it had to be you know had to reflect well on the whole collective and the gallery space and the studios but um, yeah, that sense of self-initiating, I really, I really learned that at the Royal Standard over, you know, two, three, four years. And it gave me enough confidence to start the Double Negative, um, which is a regular online magazine and a regular print. I would never have started the Double Negative if I hadn't kind of just found some confidence and some experience at the Royal Standard. And that sense of not asking for permission, like that's literally how things get done when you're just working with a bunch of other artists on a five pound budget. <laughs> you know, you haven't got anything, and, but you might have a space together, but you've, and you've got friendship and you've got interests and that's where you start and you try and build your resources up around that. Um, I just, yeah, I think for many people who don't have a traditional way into the arts, who don't have access into this and just don't really understand yet what it means to them or how they might what type of job they might want to do in the arts just starting their own project is so important because mm. it's not just about experience it's it's absolutely about confidence and it's about showing people what you can do as well isn't it Sarah it's it's like saying hey don't underestimate me just because I graduated you know a few months ago I am a person with ideas and you should work with me and pay pay me to do this <laughs> and that track record that you build by just starting stuff that's that's what people like us would look at um because obviously lots of people graduate those that start stuff so i kind of think it's it's very interesting that you just started the double negative so that kind of wanting to develop the, your writing side as well and the potential for that and look at double negative now is incredibly respected uh, you know it's it's doing you know people look to double negative and double negative reviews because they they're of such quality um so i'm really interested you brought that in that kind of learning around writing and maybe where it would sit with photography into the project um but i thought we could just ask Mario a minute because writing and photography has a history, obviously, yeah. and there's a kind of particular way that writing has happened around photography um, historically. Perhaps you could kind of introduce some thinking around that. Yeah, I mean, as, I mean, it goes without saying that writing is just essential to photography, to to our appreciation and understanding of, of the medium, really. So, and uh, and. You know, it, writing helps to kind of crystallise ideas that are kind of latent in the Im image, and really good writing allows, uh, you know, it allows images to kind of bloom in the mind. Really, so it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I think I think it's it's something that needs to be put front and centre, and some and and uh, and to and to and to offer that kind of offer that. Uh, that potential for collaboration to the, to these photographers, to these new emerging photographers, I think is really important. And uh, I really like Laura's kind of idea of, of being quite open, open, uh, of embracing this open brief really, and this kind of experimental brief and, and playfulness, rather than adhering to like you have, like you said, Sarah, we have, we have kind of conventions in 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 photography writing, um, particularly in catalogues, you know, large exhibition catalogues, for example, which which are about kind of explaining the work in, in, a, in an understandable way. But yeah, I think if, if with this kind of experimental model, we can actually open up the possibilities of uh, different possibilities of understanding or interpreting or reading, reading the work really. So it's quite exciting. And, uh, and, it's, and to be able to put photography and writing on an equal kind of footing, I guess, is, 
is in a publication, I think is really interesting rather than one serving the other. It's just kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're working together. Yeah. So, so yeah. So yeah, it's exciting. I think just to make that space for things to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really kind of, it's, it's knocking things up in the air, isn't it? With that relationship between writing and photography. And, you know, it is, it is sort of, you know, it's very Laura-ish in terms of, you know, sort of slightly kind of saying we're not, we're not going to follow the standard way of, putting these two, what are very creative practices together. Laura, perhaps you could say a little bit more about the range of, of, of writing and that kind of symbiosis between those two activities. Well, I think we all wanted to follow in some way the model that Open Eye Gallery have already set with Tilt, your in-house zine, which is really readable. It's handbag sized. It's cheap to produce, but it, it really acts like an alternative exhibition catalogue. It's really Not fun. That to read. Cheap. Not that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's absolutely within the zine spirit though. Um and it's it's just so readable. It's not a big massive coffee table exhibition catalogue. But each each time you do, you know, a season of exhibitions, it's there and, and people can engage with the works more through really interesting writing. So I think um we were all really excited, weren't we, about doing some kind of alternative exhibition catalogue for First Light in that vein. Um, and now it's turned into 13 new interdisciplinary texts, about 13 photographs, really, which is super exciting. I mean, I suppose I don't want to I don't want to put my rose tinted glasses on with all this like I don't want any of this to sound like easy or breezy the stuff we're talking about this is really challenging even for experienced writers to to receive a brief that says you can write in any form style or tone you have a 500 word count limit you must interview a photographer and learn about them and you know discuss your research interests and then go away and write something that's completely your own and you have free reign. That's really, really difficult. And it hasn't been easy, but God, it's been brilliant. And I've been really impressed by just the, the vigor that everybody's approached it with. And there's been an editorial process, you know, we're still going through back and forth edits to make sure the texts are truly reflecting the photography which is what we ask them to do. You know, do anything you want, but reflect what you're saying, look carefully, respect the work, pay attention, write something more and something better than we can just see ourselves, enrich, enrich this thing, talk about things that are relevant to you, about hot topics, issues, current news stories, all of this that's already inherent in, in the image because Mario and, and the team, you know, have picked a really amazing selection of emerging photographers that are working on like all the issues you could think of today. So it's an important kind of, um, it's like testing the temperature of our times, isn't it? Any group exhibition like this of young graduates, it reflects the era that we're living in. Um, so to have then commissioned to pay for writing to go alongside that to contextualize it all is just um yeah the icing on the cake really so i'm excited to see how this turns out and and how people enjoy it yeah i think there's there's definitely something there which i was kind of we were talking before about mario perhaps you could talk about you know the possibility of this of a kind of dating agency frankly <laughs> uh you know uh, so, so, some way of of developing a dating agency because like you say writing and photography goes so well together, sits so well together. But we, we have, you know, we have been boring in, in terms of the conventions that we explore sometimes, I think. Mm. So, uh, Mary, what do you think about that? You know, what are the sort of potentials? And in fact, we've got a question from somebody which actually is sort of saying post-COVID, mm. what do we think? The, you know, once locked out's lifted, what do we think are the kind of potentials for working with with these kinds of scenarios and also with the digital. Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredible how 
you know, this technology was just sitting there <laughs> and it was all ready to go. And it's only this crisis which has allowed us to kind of tap into its potential, really, and uh, and just realise what we had in front of us. And it, it is, you know, as as awful as it's been, you know, it's been an absolute godsend to be able to get things going uh, completely uh, cross boundaries, um, physical boundaries that we've we've that have usually kind of inhibited us. And we just we've been able to just, you know, just work across nations and uh, and and across the country just to, to be able to do this. So uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it's striking the right balance as we emerge from COVID. I think I think, you know, it's given us this renewed appreciation of actual tangible uh, things, uh, definitely. Um, so and you, like you said earlier, we can't replicate that physical experience really and there's nothing like it but uh but to, to strike that balance to kind of use that potential that networking building potential i think of, of of this technology and 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 yeah and even online content obviously but it's just like yeah harnessing all of that i think is is is, is the way forward but yeah in terms of the writers and photographers it'd be great if yeah if, if some of them you know are able to cultivate a lasting lasting kind of partnership really you know that's that's the thing isn't it I mean creative partnerships and collaborations like the chemistry's got to be right obviously and your interests have got to be right but but when it when it you know when it works it can be a kind of a lasting uh, symbiotic thing so it's uh so yeah I hope that comes out of this um yeah it's it's often a bit of a luxury having a having a writer write for your work or it's perceived as such isn't it certainly when I was a student I wouldn't dream of asking a writer to write about my work uh but so it's so it's great to have that as a yeah as something that we're we're actively um, encouraging really and and making happen yeah. And I, I kind of think you know the the, the questioner in, um, um, was was someone called Nick Small, and I think what was interesting about his question is a number of people have picked up on on similar, but I think what's interesting about his question is this idea that we're coming out of lockdown. Obviously, we all want to go into the real world and see stuff and. Mm. But it is important, I think, to actually look at what's been opened out here. Um, because one of the things that have been, I know we're all probably on Zoom all day and we think there's too much Zoom in the world. But once we come out and we start to exist in the real world, mm -hmm. what will we take from it, do we think, um, that we could take forward? Um, and I think, you know, that idea that, that you and Laura came up with of some kind of dating agency, because I, I imagine for Laura, for the for the writers also, it is an opportunity, isn't it? Um, so, and maybe they wouldn't have thought previously of working with photographers. Yeah, this is the first time that I think most, if not all, no, I think one of the graduates have written about photography before. All the rest hadn't and wouldn't actually consider themselves to be writers. And this is something that I really wanted to encourage um, through the tutorial process and the mentoring sessions that we've been running over Zoom. Writing is so important. All three of us write, we have to for our job, we have to write funding applications, we have to write professionally, and we also write creatively, critically, in really different ways. It's an essential tool to be able to write and to cultivate writing, so to develop your voice on the page is really empowering. You might not start off as the best writer, but every time you write, you improve and you get better and better and better and you gain confidence. Um, and every time, like I, I, every time I write about something, it's about something completely different. That's also the beauty of, of writing about contemporary art. I have to like study a mini GCSE or something every time I research an artist on their work and it just keeps you interested in the world. Um, but yeah, writing's really scary. It's bloody hard as well. You know, I've been writing for a long time. It doesn't get any easier, but I really enjoy that challenge. Um, and, you know, they say you're only as good as your last text. <laughs> that's true. That's true for all of our projects, right? You're only as good as the last <laughs> thing that you did. And it's just been really, really cool to, to thrash this out with the graduates and to talk about challenges and barriers and then problem solve. So, yes this bit's really hard to, dif it's difficult to talk about. No, you're not from this cultural background. How are you gonna approach it? No, you don't know about this technology yet. Go away and research it. Really dig into the themes, concepts, ideas, materials, processes behind 
these photographs and and say something that hasn't been said before in your voice in your way in your words because this is another thing that we're kind of really into right at open eye it's talking about art in a very in lots of different ways but also that's kind of moving away from jargon or terminology for terminology's sake or traditional forms of arts criticism that might have put people off reading it I think that's what we're kind of talking about Um, and so there's so many there's so much room as Mario said there's so much space we can make for people to do their own thing at our venues and in our fields people shouldn't feel that they can't partake in something just because their face doesn't fit or their accent doesn't fit or they haven't studied writing or the list goes on right <laughs> the, yeah. you can put a lot of things in your own way and other people do put things in your way as well that like you have to move out the way yeah I mean that that brings me to another question this is a question actually from from Shirley Ann and she's she's asking if if this kind of uh this is a great idea and she's suggesting that um could we could we do something which include includes uh, um older people and she's she's runs uh, in Stretford an uncamera club I'd love to know what the camera club is, um, but we'd love to be involved. And I, I, I absolutely think that the, the potential for these kinds of collaborations is giving people voice, giving people a voice and it's shared with public and shared with wider group, groupings of people. And I think, you know, w- when we're talking about how we do that, um, so kind of removing the jargon, the jargon is because often you learn that, you learn a certain jargon. I think one of the things I learned when I left art school um, was, uh, so I was originally a practitioner also Royal College, but when I left was also, where's my, you know, really unlearn quite a lot of the things. You know, your tutors are great, they're great, but they're subjective, they come from wherever they come from and they're incredibly supportive and I'm still in contact with many of the people I was was, um, at college with, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a bit of you that needs to just unlearn some stuff and think about, right, now that I'm not in that world, where's me? And often the me bit, that kind of voice and the difference that that voice come, that comes out in the me bit is the bit that kind of gives you confidence to continue without all of that support, mm. yeah? So it's kind of this massive web that seems to be happening here. Lots of universities been hugely supportive of this project, obviously, lots of other partners And I'm kind of thinking whether we could just, this is just the first talk that we're going to do. And I'm wondering whether you could give us a taster of some of the other talks that are coming up um, before we kind of close today as we're sort of running out of time. Mario, what what have you got coming up soon or what would you like to talk about coming up soon that people can join in? Yeah, so I'm looking forward to, um, so we've given all uh, all these talks titles just, just to kind of um, reference some of the themes they, they tap into. So this one uh, coming up on the 13th of April is called Unearthly Matter, and it features the work of David Ketley, who's a graduate from Sheffield Hallam University. And uh, he his work is intriguing in that it's, it's kind of suggesting a connection between the celestial and the biological. So he's kind of looking at his mi- micro, microbacterial uh, uh, organisms that, that live within us and and the results kind of remind us of outer space really so it's it's we're, we're, you know that's it kind of pretty much covers everything doesn't it <laughs> biological to the celestial but uh yeah it's so this it should be fascinating and uh, laura's actually taken it upon herself to write about this piece uh, about his uh, about his project so it'd be great to have her back on uh talking in a writer's capacity and and um and we've got michelle lazenby as well who's actually uh, a point of a big point of influence for David's work. She was a lecturer over at SHU, so um, at Sheffield Hallam. So, so yeah, that's that's going to be really intriguing, I think, and I'm looking forward to that one. Brilliant, and look, Laura. Is a there's a there's a uh, another event. Oh, we're talking about the recent events. You please go and look on online at Open Eye to actually find out all of the events. But we're talking about sorry the events that are just coming up. So, Laura, have you got something you'd like to introduce to everyone? 
Yeah, this is um this is the the rest of the first light talk series that are all bookable, they're all free, and they're all on completely different themes with different people who've been part of this huge project. So please do um book onto any talks that that kind of capture your imagination. And I should also say as well, we have re- there are a lot of people from non-traditional, the non-traditional graduates involved in this program. So they're not all all the writers, for example. They're coming from Salford, UCLan, MMU, but they're also coming from Writing on the Wall um, Literature Charity in Liverpool, the Literature Organisation and Festival. So lots of different ages, not just youngsters, <laughs> people from all different types of backgrounds. Um, on 30th of March, I'm hosting the talk called Corrupted Archives, and that's with UCEN photography graduate Chanel Franzine and her writer, University of Salford Fine Art graduate Eleanor Woodley and then also uh, Chanel's tutor will be joining us Andrew Mosley so that'll be a really interesting uh, discussion of Chanel's work the glitch aesthetic family relationships trauma isolation and all these beautiful fractures and ruptures that Eleanor has addressed in her text about Chanel's work so it's a real love letter to this to this kind of glitch aesthetic and what it what it might mean in the age of COVID, really. So that's on 30th of March. So that's a taster of some of the first events, but like like Laura says, do go and have keep an eye on the website and start booking for the other events. Um, fantastic to have you both with us. And um, obviously we, we want to continue this. this. This is a pilot. We want to learn from it. And can you, so for anyone listening, do drop us a line, uh, tell us what you think of the model and, and the talk series as it goes on, and we'll endeavour to take whatever you say on board, positive or, or negative, and look at how we might shape this model going forward. It is a pilot, so um, please do, you know, have a good look at what we're doing and feel free to be as straight as you as you want to be in terms of what you think we could approve, other things that we might be able to do. Um, we're always open to that. Um, but thank you so much to Mary and Laura for, for all of it, for, for making this project happen in, in really difficult and weird circumstances. But actually also, I think, mostly for growing it and growing that grouping of partners that have come on board to support these early career curators, because I think uh, early career artists, because I think actually with all of those partners on board, we've got a huge potential, haven't we, going forward to kind of sh- reshape, remodel once we are normally going back into the real world and keep all of the best bits from this virtual space that we're existing in at the moment. Thank nice. you everybody for, for coming along and, and for all of your questions and for all of your very positive comments. There's, there's many of them. Um, and there's also some interesting things to actually look at uh, in the chat, which you might want to cut and paste quickly now before we leave the session. Um, Mario? If I could say quickly, yeah, just for um, the exhibition, just to give a bit more insight into dates and when that's actually happening. So we've managed to nail down a date in the 22nd of May, at, that's at Castlefield New Art Spaces in Warrington. So not far from Manchester or Liverpool, nice and equidistant. And um, yes, so that'll be going on for six weeks up until the 4th of July um, with the publication launching simultaneously. So yeah, that's, that's we'll, we'll keep you updated with that. And uh, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll keep mentioning that in all of these talks. Okay, that's it. And we're, we're really hoping we'll see you in the space. And massive thanks, obviously, to Warrington uh, Borough Council for supporting yes. us as well as, as Castlefields to kind of get that, that going. Not to Warrington, and, well, not forgetting them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully to everybody that's attended, thank you so much for coming along. And do come along to the next sessions. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.